Good evening. Good afternoon. Uh, I think we have a bit. Uh, let me just. Uh, good. Uh, well, good evening. Good morning to uh, to everyone as well. I think I've got a uh, double. Is it echoing? It, no, it's not. So. Okay. okay. Hey, hey um, well, welcome. welcome. Well, now it is. Presentation. <laughs> no, now it is. <laughs> now, now it is. is. How is that better? Yeah. Yep, much better. Okay, great. Well, thanks. Sorry about that, everyone. Uh, welcome to our presentation titled On-Site Thermal Desorption in Piles Applications in Remote Sites. I'm John Sankey, a Solutions Engineer for True Blue Technologies, a sales engineering firm that supports Hamer's Technologies in Western North America. So today we're pleased to have Jan Hamer, Hamer's founder and CEO of Hamer's Technologies Group giving the presentation, it said. So Jan holds uh, degrees in mining engineering, geological engineering, and hydrogeological engineering, and business administration. He has been working in soil remediation since 1991. He's the main inventor of various patented pending in situ thermal desorption technologies. And in 1923, he started Haynes Technologies USA with Miles Stumba as the president who is on this call. So, Jan, thank you for presenting today. You now have the lead. Well, thank you, John. I'm just uh, trying to overcome a little hurdle in uh, opening a presentation, but I'll share it in the condition it is it, it, uh, until it, it's done. So, well, good good morning, good uh, good afternoon to all of you, and thank you for attending. Um, the, the topic that uh, I'd like to share and address with you today will focus in particular on remote sites. So I, I will start to share my screen and and uh, unfortunately, it's not in the present presenter mode because it's still opening and charging, which is something weird. Sometimes it may be blocked, but uh, it, it it matters not. I, I will be able, I guess, to go through it until it's done. So the, the, the purpose of today was, as I said, give you a brief overview of uh, indeed who we are uh, briefly and then jump into one specific application of um, ESTD, what we call it, so in pile thermal desorption, which is then applied to very specifically remote sites. And as we define it uh, later, what 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 characterizes uh, a remote site, I think it's a uh, it's a pretty neat application that is uh, almost, I mean, actually by accident, but which is actually very well designed for these sites. So let's uh, let's move quickly to a short company presentation. Uh, Hamer's Technologies, I mean, as John said in the introduction, I've been doing uh, remediation since the early 90s and in particular, in particular thermal since um, coming from a background of rotary kilns. Um, some of you have seen maybe, or I've even worked with some of uh, our former facilities. This one was in the north, in Southern California, another one was in Europe. We had about 14 of these. And um, when it comes to applying it to remote sites, we, we started to, um, to get the, the let's say the first innovation i was still proud to own a expired patent of 1992 to put a rotary kiln on a truck which was the first way we addressed more remote site by just moving the kiln to the location instead of moving the dirt to the treatment facility um early 2000 we came into uh in situ applications still with the same approach with uh let's say gas fired burners so that's uh what we invented the first one were pretty big and then later on we went into the shorter ones which are uh, i mean smaller individual burners which is essentially the very early version of what we are doing today in a nutshell our company uh we're based in part in belgium and part in north america as uh miles Tumbo, our current president in in uh, in north america uh has been introduced by john we're based in south dakota and we're active currently we have a uh, project running in in idaho and upcoming upcoming products in the, also in Southern California. We're a, we're a group of engineers, essentially engineers and field people, um, uh, short of 60 people. And we come, we're pretty proud to say that we come from very, very diverse uh, origins and countries of origins. Um, I'm not so proud of the fact that we are not uh, 
gender balanced yet. We still have um, a dominance of people like me. Um, but before I enter into the, 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 the core of the presentation today, I'd just like to share a little word of why we're doing this and why I and mean, what, what have what has driven me and what has uh, driven essentially our company. Why are we doing all that? And I think it all relates at the end of the day to sustainability development goals. And when we clean up contaminated land, we actually address nine of the 17 SDGs. And I think it's pretty important to remind everyone from where we're coming. Um, and also in the discussion about linear or circular economy, I think it's pretty important to so remember that we all come from a, a period and which is unfortunately still applicable uh, in many parts of the world where we chose the linear solution of contaminated land, which is you use the land, it's contaminated, you dig it, you send it somewhere else, and then you, you take a clean and valuable material and you backfill it. That's essentially the definition of level one linearity or anti-circular. Getting soil treatment facilities, as I showed you in the early 90s, of fixed facilities where you bring dirt to, at least it's a, it's a first step in circularity where you take the dirt and at least you recycle the dirt. You still have to dig it, you still have to haul it. It's, a, it, it, it's relatively cumbersome, but it's a step in the right direction when it comes to uh, sustainability or circularity. Then the next step is to go then much more, uh, let's say sustainable, avoid the transportation. So go on site. The yeah, first thing was to put it on a truck. And as you see how we do it now in piles. So you avoid the transportation. And then, of course, you can do it in situ, which I will not address too much today uh, because, as you see, it's maybe not the direct, the most common application for um, a very remote site, but that's essentially the, the final step in sustainability. So in, in, in a few words, what we try to do in, in, uh, in, in, in our company and, and, and in the technology we try to bring to the market is essentially to get technologies that are rapid, that are effective, that are climate friendly, that are affordable and predictable. And that, that is summarizing that acronym of RECAP, which is essentially our vision on the type of development, technological development we're trying to put forward. We work in, in our business, the, the business model we have, which is a little bit of um, different in, in 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 our market is that we uh, we are a technology company so we work exclusively with partnerships with local companies in this case for example uh, US companies so we are not a contractor as such we are doing this uh, always in partnerships with local contractors and we are definitely providing specific equipment and um, of course, design, engineering, detailed engineering, and monitoring and supervision. But we're not we're not typically a, a full fledged uh, contractor. We try to partner with contractors and bring what contractors don't have, so that in total we can provide a pretty good solution. And to that to that extent, we have also set up over the last four or five years a completely uh, up to date um, learning platform, so that we can also transfer that technology as much as possible to our partners and also to our customers so that you know the more they know about the technology we don't work with the black box we open the box essentially on it telling how it works and how it can be applied um two main ways to do thermal either excavated soil in piles which is what we're going to address today and the other way is in situ and uh the fundamentals are the same just the applications are different and the reason why we're going to focus on the Piles today is it's probably the best way to apply it, or it's most applied in remote sites, as we have seen for ourselves over the over the over the time. Maybe now I see that it's done, so I can switch to yeah. See, I can switch to the to the full view. Um, so let's dig into it. What is essentially uh, what are the specificities of remote sites? Um, well, when you look at the specificities. Usually we face logistics issue. Remote sites by definition are hard to reach. So um, mobilizing is mobilization is a problem or is or is a challenge, not, not by definition a problem, but it, it's hard to mobilize. Um, just going in and out to providing stuff is, is just more difficult than in a regular industrial area where you can source everything pretty quickly, which makes it a challenge to get some support, to get some supplies in. It's the legendary issue we had in the days with Rotary Kilns where we came into very remote locations location and we you know we break a bearing and we are we shut down for four weeks by the time we have to charter a flight to get to get the bearings because you can't have everything as spare parts in in in, in a pretty complex 
unit running far away. Um, also in remote sites, we often see that dig and dump is not readily available because it's remote. There isn't or or there is available when you say I'm doing nothing. I'm just putting it next door, but essentially you're really you're usually pretty far off. So it's kind of expensive and usually not very sustainable. Um, in remote sites, we also see whether it's up north or you know in in tropical equatorial regions in islands uh, um, that they tend to impose strict targets. And the logic there is it's usually in a dismantling or in a closure area. And you know it was pretty pristine nature before, and they claim and they want they want it to get back to the original condition. Um, and then on top of that, in some environment, they're very sensitive environment, and I'm thinking particularly in the north, uh, that that then the standards you have to reach are pretty strict uh, given the condition, which has led in the past to dig and dump, because at least you can achieve that, it's very expensive, but now we can also achieve that without digging and dumping. So we face usually, let's say, when we look at problem owners, oil and gas and military sites, are you know, they, they make up the bulk of the of our um, of problem owners in remote sites. There are a bunch of others, but these are really the core of uh, what we what we see. What we see, uh, what we have as an asset, is often uh, available earth moving equipment. Let's say standard, typical earth moving equipment, excavator, uh, front front end loaders, that kind of stuff. That's readily available, and usually diesel and heating oil is something that you can source pretty easily. The rest is more of a challenge in 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 these uh, in these sites. Quick word about uh, the technology itself, the smart burner technology. Um, some of you have already applied, some of you have seen it uh, or know it. Um, to explain it simply, it's putting heating elements in the soil steel pipes, and we work with double pipes where we circulate hot uh, fluid. In this case, most 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 of it is air. Which heats then the heat the, the the metal pipe and by conduction will start to heat the soil. When the soil is at temperature, contaminants of concern will start to vaporize, and we then recover those vapors in specific vapor extraction tubes. And we'll see what we can do with these uh, contaminants. We can either reburn it, we can condense it, or we can uh, neutralize them. But that's the that's the mechanism of how it is applied and how it uh, it it transform it transforms a pile of contaminated soil into a pile of clean soil. Um, this can be done as as I illustrate in this in in this picture uh, with liquid fuel We're on the left hand side with gas volatile fuels so gas or propane or butane or with electrical uh, heaters. As you will see. Electrical heaters have a tendency to be much more challenging in remote areas due to the lack of available uh, grid or electricity or enough power to do that. But that's essentially the three ways to apply it. Can be done in situ. You see that liquid or gas um, heating looks very much the same. It's, there, there are a few differences, but from the outside, it looks very much the same. Of course, the electrical heater with conductive heating are pretty uh, different in the look uh, and, and how they. I mean, all, in all the support that is needed. When it comes to ESTD, so in the pile, um, there's not there's not much of drilling to be done. It's essentially the um, let's say the Italian lasagna cooking. You put a layer of soil, then you put a, a, a layer of heating elements, then you put another layer of soil, another layer of heating elements, another layer of soil, etc. So you build that lasagna, and 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 you just Put with typically uh, the help of an excavator or, or, or a loader, you put those those tubes in there, and then you cover it, and that's essentially how you build up a pile. And then the heating, you know, occurs just like like with an in situ uh, heater or um, thermal product, where the the main element is heating the soil here, and of course the heat causes the same effect, which is vaporized, mobilize the contaminants in the vapor form, which are then extracted through perforated vapor tubes. So that's the, the in a nutshell, how it works and um, type of contaminants it can treat. It's um, hydrocarbons, either from coal or from oil and chemicals. Uh, and then it does not treat heavy metals. Uh, the only metal he treats is mercury because it's the only volatile one. It doesn't treat heavy metals because at those temperatures you don't separate metals from soil anymore. 
but uh, anything else can be mobilized with thermal and can be recovered. That's essentially the the um, the message here. Now, is conductive heating in a pile as well? What does that mean? That the contact with the soil is actually the way that the heat is transferred into the soil. So, as you can see here in that um, thermo uh, thermography, you, there, there is a pretty homogeneous way that the heat will go will will transfer away from the heating elements until we have reached target temperature at every point and including in particular the coldest point which are the farthest away from uh, all the heating elements and then that's the step one which is heating the soil making sure that it gets at the required temperature the second step we'll talk about how we collect the vapor so that's the first element and the ascent the essential word i i said here is conductive heating uh, and why is conduction so important it's as in, it's even more important in situ but it's very important in piles as well because conduction is pretty much the same the con thermal conductivity doesn't vary much depending on the type of soil what does that mean that you know between sand and clay you have a factor two and a half which is very very little as a difference between conductivity so heat will travel a little bit faster in this case in clay than in sand but not very much when you compare that to permeability say you would inject uh, hot vapors in soil or you would inject anything else in the soil of course it will follow the path of least resistance and it and and that would go for permeability to air with a factor 100 million different. That means that if you inject something, you will treat around, along the path of least resistance very well and very quickly, but you will take it will take a very long time before you reach the the least the, the last uh, the, sorry the least permeable part of the of the soil, and and that makes for a very inefficient heating in in this case. So that's essentially why we use conduction in this in this um, environment. Uh, the view here is how the pattern is in how we put those heating elements uh, in the pile. Uh, on the left hand side, you see it from the front view. You see a first layer, a second layer, a third layer. It's essentially a triangle, which is the best way to cover it. Uh, if that were to be in situ, it would be exactly the same view, but from above. And uh, the critical element, which I will talk a little bit later uh, about, is the is that D here, the interdistance which is also the density or the energy density. It's uh, how far away they are from each other. And you can already feel that, of course, the more you put, so the, the, the closer they are from each other, the quicker you will, you will uh, heat it up. But of course, the more equipment you will need. In some other applications, we'll do it in, in containers, and then it, it, it's not so much of a triangular, but it's more of a regular pattern, but it doesn't matter very much in the heat efficiency in that case. Um, what I was telling about was, um, you know, the 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 relation, you know, the density. How close are they from each other? Um, ideally, you'd say if they, if I put it, if I put a, pile, a, a heating element every foot, um, it would be uh, it would be a few days, and it would be done. I would have achieved and reached my target temperature. Because remember, I need to reach a certain target temperature. And when I reach that target temperature, I know that the transfer from liquid or solid to vapor has been achieved and I can extract it. So that's my goal. Um, of course, if I if I take them farther away from each other, so if I'm at say three meters, like nine or 10 feet, it will take me about five to six months to reach the same effect, the same temperature. So why would I do that? I would only do that because I will save a hell of a lot in equipment and, and, and in, I mean, in heating element. And usually in in situ, it will be more effective. It would be even more important because I will also save a lot in drilling in piles i don't save that much in 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 putting heating elements because you know it's just taking them from one place to another there's no drilling cost as such um but we tend to have a sweet spot usually around 1.5 2 meters interdistance in piles so that gives you an idea about the density which leads us usually to a treatment time about 30 days that is typically what what we are aiming for which is our experience of getting to an economical optimum for that. Well, this graph is pretty well known. It's the graph of, of temperature. So four stages when you start heating. The first stage is to reach to 100 degrees C, 212 F, to make sure that uh, you reach the boiling point of water. Once you get that, you'll see the temperature you will, will stay at that level for 
a certain time, <laughs> and that is uh, purely dependent on how much water there was at the beginning. Once that all the water has been vaporized, we go above 100 degrees until the target temperature. Once that is reached, essentially the first step of the treatment is done. All the vape, all the contaminants have been mobilized and have been extracted from the pile in this case. So the soil is clean, rest you to cool it down and to go back to your original natural temperature. When I say that and when I thought when, when in, in some cases you don't need to go to 100 degrees, typically chlorinated solvents, PCE, TCE and, and, and the likes. And so you see that the treatment will take way less time because you don't need to overcome that 100 degree hurdle. And why is it so important water? It's essentially because when you do the energy balance, you'll find out that out of 100% of the energy needed to reach, say, 200 degrees uh, Celsius here with 15% moisture at the beginning, almost two thirds of that energy is just used to eliminate the moisture. And that's that's the first very important point I want to make is that any water that can be extracted with mechanical ways, with you know natural drying, or is going to improve tremendously the speed and the cost of the thermal treatment. Because no matter, you know, no matter how much oil there is, the first thing we have to overcome is water. And in all oil and, uh, and gas projects or heavy chemicals, we need to reach temperatures well above 100 degrees. So we need to go, we need to extract all the water. So that is going to be the, the critical para parameter in design, in duration, and in, of course, cost, which are or a big part uh, uh, related. And you can see this here yeah. in this. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, no. quick, yes. Yeah, quick question. So for chlorinated solvents, do we have to get rid of all the water? If you, let's no. say you've got chlorine. So, no, no, okay. no, 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 no. You will see that for chlorinated solvent, typically our temperature is about 90 degrees. But keep in mind, that doesn't mean you don't extract any water. You'll still have to take, take out some water because even at 90 degrees, you're going to start to extract quite a bit of water. Um, the reason why I don't, I, I will not expand a lot on, on chlorinated solvents is that, at least in our experience, um, most of the remote sites, as, as I said in the introduction, were, were focused on oil and gas and military sites, and unfortunately, they have, they have to deal with heavier contaminants. But your point is well taken, and it's, 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 it's quite pertinent that uh, relevant to remember that you don't have that same balance when it comes to chlorinated solvents, which also explains why you have a factor 2, 2.2 between the energy consumption for thermal, for chloride solvents and the energy consumption for um, hydrocarbons, for example. That, 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 that's about the relationship in total consumption. And it's not because of the hydrocarbon itself, it's because you have to get rid of all the water. And, and as you see here, heating the soil itself, if you could just dream of completely dry soil with contamination, it would only take you a third of the energy amount that is needed, but, but that does not exist. Or um, we've had few cases in very dry climate, we still have three, four, five percent, but that makes a huge difference, I can tell you, in, in speed. As you can see here as well in this graph where you see the density, so in other words, how close they are to each other, on the x-axis and on the y-axis you see you know, how long it will take to get to uh, uh, to 250 degrees C, which is a usual temperature for hydrocarbons. And you see the difference here is how much initial moisture there is. And you see, take for example, 2.5 meter. If it's very dry soil, say 5%, uh, you, you will be done in 40 days. And if it's 20%, which is not that wet, right? But it's pretty, say, more clay soil, more, you'll be above 100 days. All other things being equal. But keep in mind that that is a very important uh, element in any thermal treatment. And of course, it is important in pile. The difference with those of you who are more familiar with in situ is that when you talk about piles, you have to deal with a certain amount of water at the beginning, and that's it. Uh, there is no incoming water. <laughs> there is no like, there is no groundwater coming in or out. Uh, you, you control the complete environment much better. You're in a very, very, very closed environment what you treat. You, you, you're trying to heat something that is that is completely closed, and that is easier because you have to get rid of what's in there at the beginning. And in situ, it's a more open system, so you also have to manage the boundaries, what comes in and out. Also, from an energy standpoint, you can't insulate the same way. In, in piles, you can insulate in a much better way. So usually, your consumption per ton, 
or per cubic yard is much, I mean, it's not much lower, but it's like 10, 15, sometimes 20% lower. The second point I wanted to address in this um, environment of remote is the type of energy. Um, and uh, we've been confronted often with, yeah, what type of energy do we use diesel or do we use electric? Um, in particular, because it's not been that common in, in some areas to use, uh, say, diesel or, 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 or gas burners. Uh, and, and, it, and both have been applied. Or, or I mean, remind that we want to remind that first you know electricity is not a primary energy so uh, it has to come from somewhere <laughs> so uh, what matters when you make the comparison whether it's from a pure economical standpoint or it's from a uh, sustainability standpoint is if you look at, any, at electricity go the next step and say where is it coming from how is it made and in remote sites um, it is very seldom that we have them from the grid it's one of the characteristics of, of remote site that they are not connected. So not connected means that you will have to produce your own electricity and we will need some electricity as well. But of course, not that not, not for the heating. But if you do it for the heating, you will have mostly to use generators and that's that's that will then use typically diesel as a uh, as a primary energy source. Um, so that's pretty important to keep that in mind when you uh, when you do the math and when you do the design and in particular then in this case to uh, keep in mind that you could use generators or solar panels uh, but i haven't seen many projects that can go uh, high enough or provide enough energy so with solar panels to get to temperatures that are required in particular for um, uh, 250 degrees or for um, uh, hydrocarbons uh, this, there's also uh, the possibility to use biofuel so biodiesel or biogas um, they still cost a little bit more, so uh, um, we have uh, we've had a few projects where we've proposed that, but until now the price difference is such that at the end of the day uh, it was still conventional diesel that was used or conventional uh, natural gas. Um, then there is the issue of power. If you're not connected to the grid, and even sometimes if you are connected to the grid, there is a big limit if you use electricity about available power. Uh, there is almost no limit about available power when you're talking about diesel. It's something important to keep in mind because it will drive the design pretty much, uh, um, I mean, very strongly because if you don't have enough power, uh, you will have to spread your heaters much uh, wider, much farther away from each other. And that will increase, as I showed earlier, that would increase your duration and your total cost. So there is a, a balance to be found here. But uh, the, the, the good thing about using, in this case, available diesel or heating oil is that you're not limited and you couldn't go to the actual optimum from just a cost perspective. Um, so as, as, as a summary, I'm not going too deep into this. Uh, when you look at thermal I mean, or energy efficiency, you're about 85% when you use um, fuel and you're about 30% when you use electrical. It's not surprising. It's also why typically even in in all the energy transitions, the recommendation is to maybe get as much mechanical energy with electricity like cars, etc. But it's not yet to heat all our houses with electrical heaters. Uh, we still <coughs> focus more on insulating our houses, which is exactly what we do in these piles where we're going to insulate them and apply the least possible amount of energy to achieve the result. Um, so that that is that concludes the introduction about how we clean up the soil. So how we heat up the soil. Now, of course, we have to handle the vapors. We extract that we have mobilized them. They're now in vapor phase. What can we do with those vapors? We can do essentially three things. Typically, we can do reburn. I'm just going to talk about that. We can do conventional handling. You take the vapors out. You go to a vapor treatment unit. And, and, and you handle those vapors, or you can do in situ neutralization. I will talk briefly about that, which is applicable for typically chlorinated solvents and high sulfur content uh, hydrocarbons, which is also a, something that we have found out in some remote places, typically from crude oil with high sulfur. What is reburn? Reburn is essentially taking the, the contaminants if and when they are hydrocarbons, whether they come from coal or from oil, and to use those hydrocarbons that come out of the soil as vapors, to use them, once they are extracted, to use them as energy source for the burner themselves. So as you can see on the picture on the right, this is, this is a good illustration of how vapors are extracted once they are hot, 
and vaporized, and they're re-injected in a very specific point in the burner so that they can so that they can be uh, used as as fuel. Of course, they are destroyed because they're oxidized, but destroyed means that you know they are used as fuel as energy source, so it reduces the overall fuel consumption. And and I think that's the most important in particular. <coughs> sorry, in particular for um, remote sites, it's a zero waste. It, there is you you leave nothing behind because there is no vapor treatment unit. You don't have carbon. It's a it, it it's a very elegant way of of dealing with hydrocarbon contaminated soil. <clears throat> this is how it looks in a in a pile. You see the, the, the side of the pile and you see the vapors coming out of it and then they are re-injected in a very specific point on the burner, which is our patented technology in this case. The other conventional way is to treat vapors in a separate vapor treatment unit, which you have to do if you handle, if you treat highly, uh, um, I mean, or complex chemicals, uh, whatever dioxin you treat that, or you treat mercury, for example, PFAS, there's no way you can reburn them, but you will have to handle them separately. Very traditionally, first step is condensing them. They get hot, so they're at whatever temperature the soil is, so typically two, three hundred degrees. You condense them, so you create liquids. Then the non-condensable are cooled as much as possible, as low as possible, and what is absolutely not condensable goes over carbon, and in some cases thermal and or catalytic oxidation to make sure that all those gases are either absorbed, condensed, or completely destroyed before released to the atmosphere. It generates liquids, which themselves also have to be treated, usually on carbon or other adsorbent uh, technologies, which are pretty common. That requires, though, a pretty big mobilization because you need to mobilize your vapor treatment unit, and it also generates some waste, in particular liquid. And and if your liquids are treated well, at the end you still end up with a certain amount of carbon, which you have to dispose of or dispose of offsite. I'll address it because we had we had another web webinar specifically on that, but thermoreact is something that we we came up with, we patented recently. In the case for chloride solvents, I'm not going to talk about that, but also about sulfur, high uh, crude oil contamination with high sulfur, which then po causes problems if you reburn it because it will create corrosive gases. And, and and acid gases instead of then usually we just had to then treat them separately but what we came up with is 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 a, a new composition or a product that is replaces the gravel around the heating well what you see here is a heating well and next to that you see a vapor extraction well and around that you see that product the thermoreact which is a neutral an in situ neutralizing agent and so essentially the the sulfur will go through that thermoreact, will be neutralized, will form neutral soils, uh, inert salts, will be able to stay in the soil because it, it's just completely inert, but the vapors that come out will still contain hydrocarbons, but no longer sulfur. And as you can see it here in, a good, in, in, in an application, where you see without thermoreact, you see when temperature increases, you see the sulfur content of the vapors pretty high. That is the cause for corrosion, uh, et cetera. And when you apply the thermoreact, you see it's not zero, right? There is still a little bit, but it's, it is no longer a problem and you can completely reburn, which then gives you the benefits of reburn, uh, a little bit lower fuel consumption, but in particular zero waste and no mobilization of a large vapor treatment unit, which is, I think, paramount to um, remote sites. So that's as a how it works. Um, few illustrations now in um, in in uh, yeah. Let's say remote sites. I'll just show you one in. in look at the view, beautiful bay here in in Greenland. As you see there in the bottom, that's the that's the base. Uh, that's where we had to treat uh, a former military base uh, from the Danish army in Greenland. Uh, it is remote, only accessed by helicopter and by uh, boat. Um, so the typical uh, environment of uh, uh, hard to reach uh, locations and uh, and pristine uh, conditions. Targets are very, very strict. You need to be almost non-detect and leave nothing behind. <clears throat> so what was the contaminant? Helicopter fuel, diesel, heavy fuel. 
I'd say very, very common in, in these places. <coughs> um, well, 2,000 to 12,000 parts per million. So relatively high. If I'm not mistaken, it was maybe 100 or 200 parts per million that was the, the target in clean soil. Um, very cold climate. We did. Uh, we worked in this case in containerized format. So it's it's a pile, but it's it's in container. Why is the container a little bit more appropriate here? Because the insulation is even much much better. This is how it looks uh, from the one end. So this is for the front end. This is for the back end. So you see six burners uh, in, in a small pile. And how long would it take to heat it? It was ac uh, actually 18 days in total, and then cooling phase of five days and then dismantling the, the container. Um, as you could see here, you start increasing temperature. You stay there for a couple of days here at 100 degrees and then you go to the target temperature, 3 to 25, and then we let it cool down before dismantling, having sampling samples taken, validation, and then you can start to dismantle. Um, timing is of essence. Sorry, before I go to the timing, um, the, the the control of emissions and uh, ambient air around is essential also to make sure that you don't just have fugitive emissions and that you don't just transfer your contaminants to the uh, to the beautiful nature in this uh, in this case. Um, a same timing was of, uh, was of essence because in many of these northern projects you deal with a short season. So uh, it's it is important to make sure that you can work over the summer and you can come in, do the job and dismantle. If it's a small job like this one was, if it's a larger job, you still have a short uh, window of time to work in the summer and, and, and you need to have as much uh, treatment done as possible. Hence, a short treatment time with a high density, which was the case here. So you can do a lot in a short period of time. So again, that is a uh, specificity of uh, hard to access remote sites, uh, high north or sometimes also very high in the south. Um, just illustrating another uh, a nice place, which is the, in the southwestern part of Poland, um, uh, which in this case was not really soil, it was a, a big lake. Uh, looks beautiful, but it's it uh, the, all the sediments were very, very highly contaminated sediments. Base contaminant was naphthalene, but there were a bunch of other chemicals in there. And our partner there did the first part of the job, which was dredging the whole uh, lagoon, putting all the material in a um, soil washing plant, and then generating filter cakes, which we then put in those uh, ESTD piles to uh, further treat. And then they've been completely reused now. As you can see on the left hand side here, this is the filter cake that served as the uh, material to be treated in our uh, ESTD facility. Same range of treatment, 35 to 40 days per batch. And of course, you can do multiple batches. Um, remote sites, uh, I also I often think of oil fields. We're currently running one in uh, a pretty large one in South Sudan. Uh, I'll just illustrate one in, in Congo. Uh, it's the complete opposite of Arctic. The only different, the, but but a lot of commonalities when it comes to hard to access logistics support, et cetera, et cetera. Not a short season though, you can work all year round. Uh, but as you can see here in the built up of the pile, uh, two piles working in parallel. One is always in dismantling build up. Takes about 30 days. And while you take those 30 days to, to dismantle and build up one pile, the other pile is cooking, which takes about 30 days. So you always have a team working with the excavators and, and, and the earth moving equipment uh, and, and putting some, some uh, cement <coughs> on it on the one hand, while the other one is gently cooking. And so there is always continuous work with the local crew to, uh, in this case, clean up about 3,500 tons of soil every week. Uh, sorry, every month, not every week, with those two locations. And what was beautiful here as well is because we're in an oil field specificity, they had a lot of gas available and it was flared. So instead of reburning to save fuel, we used a bit more flare gas and we condensed the vapors instead. Uh, and by condensing the vapor, as you can see in the next slide, of course, we recovered oil and recovering. Uh, I hope I can see that here. Yeah, you can see that oil. Sorry for the noise. Uh, on the back end of the of the, of the units and
As you can see there, we were recovering about 70% of the initial crude that was lost in liquid form, which was then put back into the production and sold. Uh, the fact that we could recover 70% was, I think, quite an achievement. It was also a, a, a great way to show how the system was working and actually doing the job. Um, I see that time is flying, so I'm just going to finish quickly with a non-remote site at all, just to show that it can be done in remote areas without uh, having to worry about con about sending everything out in the atmosphere. This was in the center of Paris, and it's a mercury site. And with the same technology of a pile, here is <laughs> excavated soil from drill cuttings were put in the side in, in, in the pile, and all the rest was done in situ, either horizontal or vertical piles. It was quite a big mercury site. And the mercury was, of course, vaporized, collected in the pipes, condensed. In a, so here you see the temperature had to be reached all over the place. And the treatment the condensation unit, you can see the condensed layer and all the carbon vessels for the non condensables. And essentially, here also collecting liquid mercury. Uh, which, which which is then you know displayed in bottles uh, and if you happen to be in Paris, uh, I'll be glad to give you one. and it's it's put there on the shelf to uh, for 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 everyone to remember where they come from. So I'll conclude here and um, just to go back on remote locations. Uh, I think the, the the whole application of of piles is is really easy to mobilize. It's about a few containers, and these are typically logistically easy and and more common to be uh, uh, to be uh, mobilized. So that's that's easy compared to what we used to do with very big machines, etc. There are very few moving parts in this, as you could see it in the pictures, which means that there is not a lot of maintenance, not a lot can break. So that's pretty good. And also when you have like 75 heaters, even if you have one or two that are broken, it doesn't it doesn't preclude the rest of going and you, you can still fix those while the rest works. When we used to have these rotary kilns, if one bearing breaks, the whole machine stops and there's it's time you cannot recover in particular in very short uh, seasons. Um, it's pretty robust, so not a lot of breakage, and it's scalable. It can be done for small projects and it can be done for very large projects. Of course, timing will 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 vary from the one to the other, but it's uh, it's pretty uh, scalable. Uh, there's no need to be connected to any form of grid. Uh, it can work with anything that is there available on energy. It's a pure on-site treatment, so there is no dig and dump. You, you don't take any dirt out of the site and you produce no waste. You take everything, everything we bring, we take back. Uh, so that's, I think, a pretty strong port. So when when we leave the site, there's no pollution left behind, no waste, but also completely clean soil. Uh, and it's an actual treatment uh, to the difference of, uh, you know, digging and dumping and putting it somewhere else. So, John, I'm sorry, I'm, I've been a little bit longer, but I think that ends <laughs> my, my, my presentation and uh, I'll be glad if you have any questions to answer them and uh, and whether now or later, you can always put them in the comments or, or, or contact us and, and I'd be very glad to follow up with us. Well, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Jan. That was awesome. Um, very, very valuable. Um, yeah, a, a couple of questions came up in my mind. I'm waiting for some questions to pop up in the uh, chat list, but one is, can you share experiences with uh, the permitting required? Well, uh, it, 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 it's a pretty good. Uh, it, it's a pretty good question. Let me just turn on this light view if you want, because all of a sudden I'm here. It's it's evening, so it's <laughs> it's dark all of a sudden. Um, um, I don't know that. I think uh, it's typically something we usually don't uh, deal with directly. Uh, as I said, our, our model is that we always work with, with with partners and typically it is something that our partners have been working on up front and they take care of the permit. That being said, I can talk about my personal experience comparing piles with what we used to do with, with rotary kilns. There is a big difference in installed power and in permitting because usually rotary kilns have a big, big, uh, have, have a much larger uh, installed power, which triggers some uh, permitting uh, requirements which we typically don't have. But I cannot talk specifically from one province or one state or one country to another. It might right. it might differ. It's when you when you look at it as as, as I, I hoped you could see it in, in, in the presentation, it it's 
from the outside, it looks pretty much like a bioremediation pile. It, it, it's not, it doesn't frighten yes. people like we unfortunately had to deal with, with rotary kilns or, uh, you know, with, with bigger equipment that, that's, uh, that makes, that can make it easier, but I cannot talk for specifics because it, it varies so much from one country to another. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, see if any questions are coming up. Um, oh, someone did ask a question. If uh, the pile is a dense clay material, yep. what operating vacuum is typically needed? Oh, the, 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 the vacuum, sorry. Yes, and is it, and you, is it similar to in situ? In other words, the vacuum you need require. It, it's so, so it, it's a very good question, the vacuum. Now, the vacuum, we typically apply very little vacuum. To answer the question precisely, we aim at 50 pascals. So let's let's say half a millibar, one millibar, two millibar. That's typically what we, and I I don't know how many PSI that is. Not many, very little. So um, the, the the idea is to to suck on the on the on 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 these vapor pipes as little as we can, but to always keep the pressure negative. You'll see in the instrumentation, and, and of course I've been quick on it, but we measure continuously the the pressure in the soil. We have different uh, pressure sensors to make sure it's always negative, but it has to be as little negative as possible. And why is that? Because by doing so, you avoid attracting cold air into the pile and then cooling it down. It's like trying to heat a building with opening the windows. So. Uh, contrary to typically uh, uh, soil vapor extraction, we're not in the hundreds of millibars. We're really at a very low vacuum, but our, our uh, vapor pipes are located next to the heating wells. And that answers the question about clay material. Very next to the heating well, your clay will dry very quickly. And because it dries very quickly, it becomes extremely permeable because it, it, it reaches temperatures above 100 degrees. So dry clay, believe it or not, is extremely permeable to vapors. So that is why we locate our vapor pipes next to the heating wells and not at the cold point, which would then be a big problem for uh, extraction. And that is why uh, when you put it in the cold point, you need to apply much more vacuum to overcome that because you have to overcome the low permeable part before you reach the, the before you reach the part that is already volatilized. So that's that explains why that is why we put them we, we put them next to the heating wells, and that's why we can afford to apply very little negative pressure and therefore also save energy. Great. I think that, that helped answer the next question, which was how does extraction occur between extraction pipes and clay if it's a low vacuum? So I think you yeah, kind so, of yeah, that exactly. Idea. So so it doesn't it, it it's also it's always extracted close to the heating wells, which is the most permeable part. And so vapors always go from the least permeable to the highest permeable. So they always follow the path of least resistance, and it is going to the to the to the warmest part of the pile always. Yeah. And it's going to probably increase the pressure where it's going to volatilize and it's going to want to move even further. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and okay. we apply we apply that little negative pressure in the in the places where it's it, where it's the most effective essentially. Okay, good. Uh, let's see any more questions. Um, well, I have one. Uh, yeah, and this is a, I don't know if I put you on the spot on this one, but uh, what do you what do you think about treating uh, soils contaminated with PFAS this this way? Yes, it's well, it, it, it's totally other subject. I think we're, we're going to do another webinar. On that. We've done one previously, but we're going to do another one. Uh, I, I didn't want to address it here because it's not typically what we see in remote sites, but uh, uh, there is no there is no big difference. I mean, not not just um, uh, our company, but 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 some of our colleagues have uh, come to the same conclusion that thermal is pretty effective to, and I'm going to be cautious here, to concentrate PFAS. So in other words, at 350 to 400 degrees, you can mobilize PFAS just the way, the same way as you mobilize dioxins or mercury. I mean, the high end. They are. You can extract them, and we can extract them very effectively from the soil. And I'm saying that cautiously here because PFAS science is something that is evolving pretty, pretty quickly. So yeah. we have to be cautious. But from what we can see and measure, that is effective. PFAS are volatile. We don't destroy them though. There are still PFAS molecules. The carbon fluor molecule remains there, and we condense them in a later stage. So we transfer them from the soil into the water first, and then ultimately 
into carbon or hopefully into even better technologies that can extract them and take them out of the water. Um, but and we're following that very with a lot of interest to see what is what is working best. But our job in PFAS is to move the PFAS from one medium, which is soil, to another medium, which is say carbon, for example, and to reduce a pile of 20,000 tons to a couple of tons of carbon. We don't destroy them. We we have looked at um, applying the dioxin treatment way, where we would just volatilize them and then put them in a thermal oxidizer at 1100 degrees, even 1200 degrees. It seems to, there seems to be a scientific consensus today that that is not enough to break all the carbon fluor chains and, and, and the molecules. So as long as that is not settled, we prefer just to concentrate them and not claim that we can treat or destroy PFAS, but that we can concentrate them. Right. OK, no, that, that's that's it's just one way to at least reduce the risk. So yeah, yeah. And, and reduce the volume because the the, the 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 problem with PFAS located in soil is that they're very leachable, so they end up anyway in groundwater and in, 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 in surface water and at the end in, in the water you drink and then <laughs> and then I drink as well. So that's essentially what we're trying to do. Yeah. See any other questions have come up? Um, we're coming up to a 52 minutes past the hour. OK, uh, so I'm, I'm a little bit over time. I'm, I apologize for that. I yeah, <laughs> no, that's, no, that's OK. I just wanted to answer any of the other questions. I guess now if you have any other questions, um, please feel free. Did you, you have your contact information um, from well, anyone who attended this? Uh, feel free to email your, your questions in. We're happy to take them, take them on. All right. And uh, what's next on the way of webinars? Are we planning any in the future? Yes, and I think we're um, um, we will will announce that pretty shortly on the next one. There's one every month, so you know, stay tuned, and we'll get you we'll get you the next one next month. I guess so. Uh, it's going to be pretty interesting. So we're trying to now address more and more specific topics, and you know, we we had quite a bit of interest and questions about remote sites, so we we did this one, but the next one will be hopefully. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, and we'll be at uh, various conferences. We'll be at the, the the AHS conference. At least I will be. We'll be at the Patel conference, and so you can uh, reach out to us there as well. So, yep. I'd be glad to meet you there. Okay, good stuff. Thanks, Ian. All right. Have a good day and a good evening for those who are on my time zone. And, <laughs> and then, uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay. All right. Cheers. Bye. Bye.